All right, good morning. Thank you for being here. Um, you know, in the Buddhist tradition, uh, there are these four noble truths. And one of them, uh, the first one, Buddha says that life is suffering or there is suffering in life. And I think, wow, that seems so harsh. It seems really harsh. But then I think, well, all right, well, if I look around, though, there is certainly, certainly suffering in the world. You don't have to look far to find it. You know, you don't even need to turn on the TV if you just probably look out on the street where you live. It's interesting, it could all be so different, you know, um, that life can be so beautiful, and I think we all understand that. We all have experiences of life being really wonderful and life being really, really beautiful, and we see the possibility. You know, I mean, uh, who among us has not, like, held a baby and thought, wow, I want the world to be wonderful for this little being. You know, I want whatever our problems are, to get healed and everybody to be peaceful and satisfied. So this little one here has every chance and every possibility, right? But, but that possibility that we see doesn't seem to always prevail. You know, I think as individuals, we can, um, uh, what we do to, to, to process what we see, what we experience, is we can go to a practitioner or a therapist or something like that. We can talk about the pain that we experience in our life. But I think it's interesting that collectively, there, um, we don't do that for the collective pain. There, there's no ongoing conversation for, for how we deal with that. So, you know, in A Course in Miracles, it says that God will not take from us what we will not release to him. So I like that because, you know, um, in the Egyptian tradition, there is a god, uh, Sekhmet. And Sekhmet is, uh, my interpretation, sort of like an incarnation of the Divine Mother. And Sekhmet... Um, uh, her role is she takes from you what does not serve you any longer, is how the ancient Egyptians saw it. That this goddess took the things from you that didn't serve you anymore, which I think is sort of another, another way in, really, really powerful. Uh, for me, I think the way we look at this is that the darkness has to be brought, for the light, brought to the light. Right? That uh, people, people we know, go through really difficult, really terrible things. We all know these people. Some of them are sitting here with us today. That life can be very, very hard for people. You know, and, and sometimes, on top of that, sometimes people are just not very kind to each other. You know, we refuse to make love the bottom line. And so I think the consciousness of fear and separation uh, that is in the world around us runs deep. You know, suffering does not bring wisdom. It only brings more suffering, right? So if you were one of those people who said, oh, well, I'm suffering, but with suffering comes wisdom, eh, maybe, maybe not. You know, if that were true, we'd be a lot wiser. You know, I think, you know, because... So, um, so as I look at this idea, what occurs to me is that crucifixion in and of itself is a meaningless symbol, right? That part, uh, the point of the whole story is that there is resurrection, so when we experience crucifixion in our life, the whole point of that crucifixion is that we are supposed to then have an experience of resurrection. It's an energy pattern. You know, the, the point of the story is that God actually parted the Red Sea for the children of Israel. The point of the story is that Jesus put his hand out and stilled the storm and was able to walk across the water. You know, if you don't have, there, there's no resurrection unless there has been crucifixion. So I remember hearing this years ago in a training I was doing, that, that peacocks eat thorns. And what happens when peacocks eat thorns is that those thorns are what produce the really beautiful feathers that peacocks are known for. Right? Now, I was thinking about that, and I thought, well, you know, we all, we all eat thorns. You know, we experience, uh, we eat the thorns of loss or disappointment. We eat the thorns of seeming failure, or some of us are eating a thorn of ill health, or somebody's eating a horn, uh, the thorn of addiction, you know. And all of these things are supposed to, we are supposed to move through these things, ideally, and get to the other side, where we get to have a personal resurrection. You know, as spiritual students, we're always interested in affirming love, and we want to affirm light, and we want to affirm peace, and we want to affirm abundance for all people. And we do that, but how do I hold that with the seeming darkness of the world? Boy, that, that gets really interesting. Then I want to say, you know, it's all love, it's all God, it's all good, and yet there's this other stuff that looks so different in the world that I'm living in. And, you know, all spiritual teachings have a context for the darkness and what, what to do with it. And so for us as students of the science of mind, where I am with this now is that I see it, 
And then the next step, which is more important, because it doesn't take a lot to just see the darkness, the more important part is to deny that it has power over me. You know, that it is, it is not the ultimate truth or the ultimate reality. Right? So you can acknowledge, yes, this is my experience, but it's not who I am. Or this is taking place in the world, but it's not the truth about God's children. See, the crucifixion of the body is a symbol for the crucifixion uh, of, of the spirit that, that we go through. You know, you can destroy the body, right? But you cannot destroy the spirit that is within us. You know, I, we talk about this all the time, how it's easy to love the nice people. It's easy to love the people we're already in love with, you know? Uh, it's easy to be unattached when, when you don't have a lot to be attached to, right? But Jesus said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So I look at that again and again, and I think, okay, the important word there to me is overcome. I have overcome the world. So I think a key to this overcoming has to be compassion. Mm -hmm. uh, that compassion is sympathy for, for others' misfortunes. It's the ability to share that person's feelings. It does not mean to join in suffering with, but it may mean that we contribute to the alleviation of that suffering, right? So I'm not suggesting that compassion is you get in the pit with people. That's not compassion. That's dumb. That's what that is, right? So I believe that compassion is spirit. It's God calling us to be of greater love, greater love than we perhaps normally are. So. Um, Great love as we look at the world, as we live our lives, as we interact with each other, and as we actually participate in life and, and the world around us. I, I remember the old adage, you know, you, you, you never judge another person until you've walked a mile in their shoes. Well, maybe this is a question we can ask ourselves when we see people in the world around us that appear troubled, you know? Where has life presented me with a similar experience? You know, because I always have to come back to the metaphysical truth that, you know, I don't know what that individual's here to experience. I don't know what their soul's journey is. Now, I don't think that God has assigned suffering. So if it catches my attention, then perhaps I'm supposed to be somebody who helps hold the light, that I'm supposed to help alleviate the suffering. But for us as spiritual students, as metaphysicians, it means that I feel for you and I will know a greater truth for you. You know, because we know a greater truth does not mean that we may not be called to get involved. You know, that sometimes we know the truth and spirit calls us to roll up our sleeves. You know, and sometimes our job is to just know the truth. You know, so part of the greater healing may be that we are involved, uh, but all that time while we're involved, we keep this place of high watching consciousness, of knowing there is a greater spiritual truth here. Yes, I may be helping this person, but I know this is not all of who they are. That they too are an expression of God, and they have within them infinite potential. They have infinite possibility, infinite life, infinite love. Right? And so this that they are going through right now is a very temporary thing. It will, in fact, pass. You know, I think we're, we're, by knowing by knowing that, we're adding to the spirit, we're adding the spiritual truth. We're bringing the light to a situation that seems to be dark. You know, God is in this situation. So in addition to our physical participation, our consciousness is of great benefit also, I believe. You know, maybe when we think of compassion, we think of, you know, great spiritual beings. But I believe that God within us is calling us to greater love right now in our own lives. Maybe we think we have to do some enormous task in the world, but you know, I'm always reminded of what Mother Teresa of Calcutta said. She said, there are no great deeds. There are only small deeds done with great love. Small deeds done with great love. And I believe, okay, we are all capable of that. Everybody, everybody has the capacity to do small things and infuse those small things with great, great love. There's also a saying that when God measures a person, he puts the tape around the person's heart, not the person's head. All right? And so I think, okay, well, that's, that's interesting to me because our head will often talk us out of being compassionate. Our head will often give us the reason why we should not love, and, and our heart says usually just the opposite. You know, say, well, I just don't have time, or, you know, or who, who do I think I am to do this? You know, if we want life to treat us a certain way, we have to be responsible for making sure we treat life that way. I want to live in a compassionate world. That means it's mine to put some compassion into the world that I live in. You know, because the principle is we give what we receive. You know, we have to give compassion or we're not going to be met by a very compassionate world. That's spiritual law. You know, hoping to have a compassionate world without being the one putting compassion into the world is like sitting on a stool 
in the middle of a field and hoping that a cow will back up into you, look over its shoulder and say, please milk me, right? I mean, it's just really, really unlikely that it's going to happen, right? Um, I remember a day, this was probably a, a year or so ago, uh, and it was raining and, um, and my battery was dead, so I called AAA. Love those people at AAA. The guy arrives, of course, there's no point at being annoyed with him, it's my battery. And so he gives me the jump, and I go to my appointment, and he tells me, you know, if you keep it running for so long and then it doesn't start again, you really got to replace the battery. I come out of my appointment, the battery is dead again. Call AAA again. No need to be in a huff about it. It's my battery. I know it is my battery. My battery is my problem. So I get to the automotive center uh, to get my battery replaced. And now I, I did say it was a rainy day, so, you know, everybody is kind of in a state. You know, you know how we are in Los Angeles when it rains. <laughs> Everybody just gets a little spun out. You know, it's, oh my God, we're having weather. Oh. You know, it's been raining for 20 minutes and already the TV is saying storm watch. You know, oh my God, I've got to get provisions. I've got to get provisions. So, um, like everyone there, I'm, I, I have the option. I have the option of being harried. And I say option because I know I get to choose, right? I, you know, I, and I have a particularly righteous thought uh, going on in my head this day because I had replaced the battery a while back. But the salesman is, uh, is someone in training. In fact, he's wearing a badge that says, be patient with me, I'm in training. <laughs> he's actually wearing that badge. And I keep looking at the badge. And I look at him and I look at the badge and I look at him and I look at the badge and I think, I need a huge box of those buttons. I do. I, I need a box of those. We should all be wearing those all the time. Because, you know, there are people here at the Automotive Center who are totally freaking out because they are busy and they are having to wait and their battery is dead too. And, they, you know, it's like they're saying to the universe, don't you know how important I am? I'm so stressed. I'm in Los Angeles. You know, and the man is very apologetic, you know. And I think to myself, I could get huffy here. And I think, but then I think, but I have been that new guy. I have been the guy in training on a job, buttons and computers and phones and paperwork and identifications and credit cards and licenses and all that stuff, wanting to do it all right and afraid of making a mistake. Everybody's watching him. Like he's actually the one who's replacing all the batteries and all the tires and all that stuff. And he apologizes and he apologizes and he apologizes. And I assure him that it is all fine. In fact, I make an extra effort to thank him for his help. And I see that there's like this little bit of softening in his brow. Like a little, OK, maybe I didn't make a mistake taking this job. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, for me, that's a choice for compassion. Maybe we ask ourselves the question, you know, how would compassion feel here? If I were a compassionate person, how would I feel in this situation? Or maybe another way in is what would compassion do here? Some years back, my father was getting ready to pass. He was making his transition in the hospital. And my mother was faced with some very difficult decisions. And so I brought her into another room and I said, Mom, what do you think the most compassionate thing to do here is? And she closed her eyes for a minute and she thought and she went, OK, I know what I have to do. You know? So it's just, just that question. What would compassion do here? See, I believe that compassion naturally fills one of the chambers of our heart, of everybody's heart. And so this week, I invite us to go out into our lives and be that presence of compassion. You know, so since compassion is, is naturally here with us, right, I, 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 and I believe, I really do, it is natural to who we are. So I think, well, why don't we express compassion well, or understanding or, or caring more freely? Oh, well, maybe we're afraid if we use it, it's going to run out. It will not. It actually increases, I'm here to tell you. Maybe, maybe we're being someone who judges what's different from us. You know, um, from a very human place, we judge what's different, you know, and we also judge what we don't understand. So instead of recognizing the divinity in others, you know, or taking time to learn something about what we don't know, we just judge it. It's easier, it's faster, it's a huge time saver, judgment, you know. At least we think so. 
We think so. In the end, it takes a lot more work, you know? But it's easy to generalize to say, you know, this is wrong or this is bad because it's different. So I think about Jesus and the woman taken in adultery, you know, and people are about to stone her because that was, a, you know, that was a payment for the offense, right? And so Jesus asks the crowd, though, if you've never made a mistake, you yourself, who here has never, ever made a mistake, then you should pick up the first stone and throw it. And of course, what happens is everybody, everybody walks away, right? And so I think, okay, where am I the accuser in life? Where am I holding an accusation against someone? You know, um, we've all made mistakes, we're all learning, and I believe that compassion is the activity of God expressed in our life. Compassion is the activity of the Christ mind. We say, okay, okay, our head says it's all right to have compassion for someone else, but, but I'm not good with it for myself. You know, well, you know, I believe our heart says to us, you have to have compassion for yourself as well. This is not wallowing. This is not a pity party. You know, I wonder, well, why don't we have compassion for ourselves? You think, well, what are other people going to think of me? Well, they're going to think whatever they're going to think. You're never going to be able to control that, so at least you should have compassion for yourself because they're going to have all kinds of other thoughts about you. So at least one person in the room has compassion for you, you, right? So that can only be a good thing. And remember also that in other people, there's as much God in them as there is in you. And other people's opinions of you are frankly just not your business. Yeah. You know, so none of us are humanly perfect, you know, and we don't have to be perfect to have compassion or love or happiness in our lives or to have compassion or love for other people. You know, listening to our heart tells us that love can teach us. Love is what will teach us. I remember uh, I was uh, traveling once and I had um, seemingly misplaced my wallet. Um, and again, I noticed I had this opportunity to really spin out about that I've lost my wallet. Oh no, my wallet. Oh my God, this couldn't be worse. It couldn't be, you know, a more convenient time or place. Um, but after a minute, that passed, you know? And I thought, well, that's dumb. That's just a really dumb conversation to be holding in my mind because that energy is not going to support me in finding my wallet. And what I believe is so is that nothing is ever lost in the mind of God. And so, okay, okay, wallet found a few minutes later, you know? So whatever we're going through, our best self is always present, right? You know, um, I, I, I remember being with somebody uh, not long ago who um, they thought they'd lost their jacket at an event. And, and I thought, well, you know, the best thing to do is be supportive. The best thing to do is be supportive. I should not remind them what a wonderful jacket it was and how good it's going to look on someone else. And it's probably left the building long ago. None of that is helpful, right? I thought, I, I have to be this way myself. I think our best self is defined by what we give to other people and what we give to ourself. That's what our best self is, you know? And so to be loving and listen to our heart is not foolish or wimpy. I think it's powerful. I think it's actually godlike. And so in saying I am deserving and I know other people are deserving of good, that I'm good and other people are good, that I accept myself, that I accept other people, you know, that all of that, that's what we have access to right now. And even doing something that simple as having that little bit of compassion for ourselves as an, or, or another person is absolutely what can change the game. Let's pray. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we turn our attention inward for a moment to just be still and remember again that God is right where we are, that we are surrounded and filled with God's infinite, loving, intelligent spirit, that God within us is the most true, most real thing about us, that we are emanations of infinite, loving spirit. And in this awareness, I speak the word for each and every one of us today, that our hearts and minds are cracked wide open, and we are willing to be the place, the presence, the activity of compassion in the world in which we live. And if we don't know what to do, we just simply take a breath and ask within, all right, what would compassion do here? If I were a compassionate person, how would I express myself in this situation? Because I know that that spirit of God within us always knows what we need to know, and we turn to it now. So we include in our prayer today our family members and friends and loved ones, whoever's in our mind and heart today, and we remember that right where they are, God is. We surround them with our love, and we have compassion for them, for whatever they're going through. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world around us, and we have compassion for our entire world 
and everyone in it. We let our heart be that big, that there's room for everyone. We bless our church. We bless all churches everywhere, synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, all paths to God. And I'm certain that we are blessed by being together, that there is raising up for all of us, that we all get to be healed. And so with a full heart, I give thanks that this is so. I release this word, and so it is. Together we all say, Amen.